And now it's time for Talking Trade with Ian Cotshead and Sandy Siegel, sponsored by Michael Best Strategies and MMAC's World Trade Association. Welcome to Talking Trade. I'm Sandy Siegel, president of ME Day. And I'm Ian Coxett at the University of Wisconsin. And uh, today we have the very great pleasure of uh, uh, hosting as our guest, Emily Pickrell. Uh, Emily is a global energy scholar at the University of Houston and currently writes about energy politics and technology for Forbes. She has also covered both energy and trade for Bloomberg, the Houston Chronicle and the San Antonio Express. So welcome, Emily. Thank you. Glad to be here. So, uh, Emily, the legislation that's known as uh, currently known as the Inflation Reduction Act, currently moving through Congress, contains some of the most far-reaching environmental initiatives ever considered by the U.S. federal government. And notably, uh, these include tax credits that will cut the purchase price of uh, electric vehicles by about $7,500 per vehicle, at least for those vehicles that, that meet certain supply chain conditions. So yeah, you're an energy and a trade specialist. Tell us a little bit about the implications of this part of the proposed law. What are the key uh, likely benefits and costs to the EV industry and to related players in the energy and automotive sectors? Well, one of the things that's really interesting about the legislation is being so broad, it has a little something for, for a lot of different players that intersect. And um, one, of the, one of the big beneficiaries is, is going to be uh, uh, the suppliers of the electricity that these EV needs, that these EV, EVs need. Um, that's the uh, solar and wind and battery production. There's a, that's where uh, a large portion of the, the benefits are going. But there's another 80 billion that are, are earmarked for certain, um, certain EVs. And the, the caveat for that from, from a manufacturing perspective is that uh, it depends, you have to meet the requirements. And there's a focus on trying to steer future EV production away from China and from other countries that are perceived as, as unfriendly to the United States. So that's, that's gonna be a consideration for uh, producers. Um, there's also uh, the auto manufacturer. So, I mean, uh, Tesla is an obvious huge beneficiary of this. With uh, they have a, a vertical supply chain. They've already thought about these issues in advance. They're an obvious huge winner from the legislation. Their stock has got. Last time I checked, their stock went up about 10% as a result. Wow. Um, but other auto manufacturers that have been making those investments. It's what we're going to see more broadly speaking is a bigger push towards development of supply chains in response. And I would say a broad uh, uh, rethink in the industry uh, towards um, uh, long distance supply chains. It's something that we've already, uh, it's a theme that's already been talked about over the last couple of years with all the shortages and bottlenecks. Yeah. So how do you, you know, see us competing with China? They, they seem to be building factories at almost as fast as the rest of the world in total. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to produce EVs, and, and obviously the subsidies are aimed at changing that mix, and, and you know, and having more produced here, sold in the U.S. Can you speak at all to how you know that will will change the supply chain to to you know encourage the production here or to help support the production here? And, and well, the this legislation obviously can't be taken in isolation, and uh, there's other moving parts, including the recent uh, semiconductor legislation. Uh, there's multiple efforts to develop supply chains, and specifically supply chains for automobiles. And that movement, I expect, it will continue. One of the um, one of the big rethinks that's being done is uh, the role that nearshoring can play. And our, our friend Mexico, just to the south, is actively campaigning to position themselves. They already make about 20% of US vehicles. And, and in really a much larger portion of that when you look at their supply chain and uh, the components that they provide for cars. And they are um, uh, actively campaigning to uh, become a bigger presence in the semiconductor industry. Um, and um, we're gonna see more of that. There's, uh, China is also looking at the Mexican border um, and looking at making, they're proposing a $5 billion investment in some facilities um, in 
uh, Chihuahua and, and um, Coahuila, which is it's, it's the heartland of Mexican production. That's just, that's just one of the impacts that we don't currently know exactly what the, fall, the fallout per se is gonna be, but there's gonna be a lot of, there's gonna continue to be a series of interesting developments. And I imagine in Asia that some of the other uh, production um, that's in China will shift. The real question is um, one of the limitations in battery production is processing. And 97% of that takes place in China. Those facilities do not move overnight. It's uh, yes. battery production is very sophisticated and you, they're not pop-up facilities. So it's a, it's a, it's a continuing, uh, continuing evolving uh, situation. And we're going to see uh, we're going to see implications for other countries too, right? Because the legislation envisages the supply chains that are in the United States or within free trade partners. So that excludes Argentina, uh, it excludes Japan, yeah. uh, it excludes other countries besides China, and it's going to be a great boost for the Canadian lithium industry, I suppose, as well. <laughs> but uh, but let's um, let's think a little bit more broadly. Uh, let's talk okay. let's talk energy. Uh, these, uh, these subsidies should have a measurable impact on the percentage of the US car fleet that is uh, current, that is EV. Um, but what do you see these EV subsidies as achieving in terms of the broader goal of reducing US uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the long run? How do you see that playing out? Well, it's a, it's a big question and it's, it's again, a, a, the answer is, is that there's an awful lot of moving parts. Our, <clears throat> One of the one of the stark realities that I think that we should ne be mindful of, of uh, last year the United States produced 350,000 uh, EVs. You can have an, a big usually when the stories of EVs are told right now, the percentage of increase is 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 one of the headliners, and it's because the the percentage of of EVs on on, on the roads right now is so small. The estimate of this that by 2050, 50% of the 3 billion vehicles on the road globally will still be internal combustion engines. Yeah. And, and what, does that, what does that mean? It means that our, our end target is a reduction of carbon emissions into the atmosphere. EVs are one way to go about it if the electricity is generated by coal, which a percentage of it is right now, sure. you're still having carbon emissions as part of the process of, of fueling those EVs. So uh, one of the, at the University of Houston, there's a lot of discussion about how one of the limitations of selecting EVs as the desirable transportation solution of choice is that it effectively shuts down continued research on other solutions such as hydrogen, such as improvements in, in internal combustion engines. And the price that we, play, that we pay collectively for that is that when the money stops flowing, the improvements stop flowing. And if half of our fleet in 2050 are gonna be internal combustion engines, there will be some benefits from continual improvements. And it seems like it would be a shame to have 28 years extracted from those improvements because of a technology solution that was selected for political reasons in 2022. And I say this as, a, as someone who wants my next car to be an EV. It's not, it's not I, sound, I sound like an, an apologist for the industry, but it's just that it's gonna be a perpetual theme in talking about climate change is that we need to be both aspirational and practical. Yeah. What can we do tomorrow, but what can we do today as well? Uh, right, and, and that's only one piece of it, as you say, and I think, yes, people are getting distracted, if you will, and, and you know, I, I think that's sound advice, right? It's gonna, take, it's gonna take us looking at a lot of different things. So, Emily, thank you so much for joining us on Talking yeah. Trade today. Um, I really, really insightful on a very important and, and relevant topic, thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Emily. Yeah. And this has been Talking Trade. We'll see you in the next episode. You've been listening to Talking Trade with Ian Coxhead and Sandy Siegel, sponsored by Michael Best Strategies and MMAC's World Trade Association.